Welcome to the April edition of the AIG ALS Technical Talk. Um, our very first via Zoom webinar. Um, today's talk is uh, a talk by Howard Dewhurst on a geological view of Thermageddon. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our sponsor ALS who have done a fantastic job supporting the AIG and uh, supporting this technical series. For those of you who are new to Zoom uh, and haven't done a webinar before, uh, I'll just go through some very, very basic things for you all. Um, just let you know your microphone and cameras are inactive. Um, as you attendees, you should see something like that uh, bar with the chat raised hand Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. We will save the questions for the end, uh, and if time permits, I'll... The webinar is being recorded, and we will post it on the AIG YouTube channel um, in due course. Please note the AIG currently has a limit of 100 attendees. Uh, or there or thereabouts uh, on these webinars. So it's in the first we can accommodate. The Queensland calendar for 2020, it's been a bit uh, jumbled. We uh, were planning to have a Friday's, Friday seminar on QAQC for exploration and mining. That has been postponed. We'll let you know when we can get along and do that one, hopefully a little bit later on this year. We'd like to do that one uh, as a live in-person seminar. Uh, there was also a joint AIG, GSA, Queensland and OzIMM talk that was meant to happen in July. Uh, we'll find out uh, what's available uh, close to that time. As far as the AIG ALS technical series goes, uh, which are held on the second Tuesday from February through November, we've got a whole series of talks coming up, including crowdsourcing by Holly Bridgewater next month. Um, Cam Schweitzer from Ucrest will give a presentation on the Chiligo district and some of the work they're doing up there. We'll also have talks on Rio Tinto bauxite, um, carbon sequestration, uh, the Mississippi Gold deposit in PNG and Faro Kiraponga in um, New Zealand. We're also working on a whole series of different things we can do for all people uh, and this includes setting up a series of mini seminars. Uh, they're currently in the planning so we'll uh, see how uh, soon we can get those going. Uh, we plan to get them twice monthly, a Thursday, uh, the second and fourth of each month. Um, and they'll generally be one to three presentations with Q&A on a specific theme um, and generally run for an hour. The themes we're gonna target are basically the um, RPGO themes, which you can see listed there. We're also looking at a whole series of other events, including uh, events where we can have some member participation, uh, topical forums. We've already had one on um, uh, on coronavirus. Uh, and we'll also look to run a couple of expert panels as well during the year. A uh, quick ad for the mentoring program. This is an old uh, slide, but um, it is currently being reformatted for, uh, <laughs> to apply with the, comply with social distancing requirements. Uh, it is still open for um, registrations and uh, keep your ears and eyes out for some updates there. And on to tonight's talk, uh, a geological view of them again by Howard Dewhurst. Howard graduated with Bachelor of Arts, Honours, Geology and English Literature from Keeley University in England. and spent most of his software career in conventional and unconventional resource exploration and development. He was initially based in the UK and Northern Hemisphere, working for Exlog, GCA, Small Oil and Gas Explorers, and Gulf Oil. Later moved to Australia, working internationally as a consultant for Small Explorers, Resource Consultants, and Government Energy Departments. He's not quite retired and currently involved as a fellow of the Geological Society of London in propagating an open letter to the Society in 2018, explaining why... AAPG, SPE, PISA, PESGB, IPA, and the Saltbush Club. He's uh, definitely well and truly um, busy. So I'll now attempt to hand over to. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to talk about climate change a little bit, but uh, examples from in the past, uh, and here I think is quite a good one. desert with a mass extinction in between. At this location, I think there is an unconformity, but in the, in the, in the central Surat Basin, so there is no unconformity. You, you pass between the two. And it's quite clearly a change in climate. <clears throat> uh, just before we get into that, I just wanted to draw your attention to um, emissions, because at the end of the talk, I will be mentioning something more about emissions. There's something that many people aren't fully aware of, <clears throat> We're supposed to cut our emissions. Uh, that's what people want. Uh, but this is the this is Australia down at the bottom. Uh, here is Japan, to total of Europe, and total of North America. The line going almost asymptotic is China, China and India together. Uh, they're showing no signs of um, slowing down, and in fact, China and India between them are building hundreds of coal mines and coal-fired power stations um, to boot. So what difference will Australia net zero make or the UK, which is the red line at the bottom of the right-hand screen? I'm not sure. But one thing to start off with, uh, climate change is the result of processes. It's not the cause of anything, but people talk about it often as if it was the cause. And the climate is they generally agreed as an average weather over a 30-year period. But how do you mentally make an average of uh, an average Australian temperature rainfall, an average Australian winter or summer or average climate with all these different uh, cl climatic zones gathered together. It is clearly not an easy task. But we'll make a start. And here's some temperature data from Vulcania uh, from 1881 to 2014. And you can see that the average is 26.7 degrees centigrade for the whole of that period. And not an awful lot um, is happening in terms of uh, trends. The only trend that is increasing um, is the CO2 trend. Uh, it doesn't seem to be affecting warming in, in any way, either positive or negative. This is rainfall. This is what got me started in looking at the um, uh, climate change in Australia with the Tweed Heads golf course records uh, from 1887. And, uh, this is the average 1.7 meters for the whole of that period. And we've got a few rainy years, 1974, 1999, but the most rainfall was 1906. Uh, things don't seem to be getting any worse. They don't seem to be getting any better. It's just business as usual. The orange vertical bars are when there was also a strong cyclone involved. And sometimes this produced a lot, a lot of rain, as in 1974. And other times it did not, uh, this one here, produce in 19, 1949, did not produce a very large uh, rainfall. So a part of the reason for that happens is because most people report um, <clears throat> temperature data from January to January. Well, that doesn't really work in Australia because the year that we, um, the year we look at is in fact July to June with the um, Pacific, summer season of rains and droughts uh, happening at the end of the northern hemisphere year. So I've redone that chart that you just saw, uh, taking the, the intervals from July to June rather than from January to December. Uh, and it is different. Um, and in fact, the very dry summer of, not sure, of June 2019, there on the right hand corner of that slide, um, that, that is not repeated when you organize the chart in a different way. Um, this is one of the problems that we've got on uh, looking at data and working out which is the best. But the thing that's is still the same is that there's an awful lot of up and down. Uh, and the only thing that changes is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The, the, the rainfall isn't particularly, I don't think, showing anything um, that one could work up, get worked up about. Drought and fire. So here's a painting that, uh, by a man called William Strutt. Uh, 
um, called Black Thursday in 1851. Uh, it's got fire, it's got drought, it's got dead animals, it's got fear, panic, sheer terror going on uh, in everybody's eyes. So let's look at some, a particular example of one of these fearsome droughts. In the summer of 1939, 38, 39, uh, I'm very interested in this because that happened to be the year I was born. Um, so, but here we've got the temperatures of Rutherglen, summertime temperatures, 1939, 38, 39 was the hottest, 33 and a half degrees, uh, hotter than anything else. CO2 um, is charging up just like it has done when we looked at the previous charts. So what happened in 1939? Black Friday, the 3,700 buildings, 71 lives, five towns destroyed, over 1.6 million hectares burnt, and the commentary in the newspapers was, was of the same, same kind of terror that we had in the fires we just recently passed through. And what, is this, is, are things getting worse? That certainly looks very bad. Uh, let's see if they're getting worse. The total burning of 2019-20 fires in Australia was 20 million hectares. That's twice the size of Portugal. That's, that's a big piece of land. That's a lot of burning. That's not good by anybody's imagination. Um, but in 1970, there were 110 million hectares burned, and that's the size of France, Spain, Portugal put together. So things do not seem to be getting particularly worse. And don't forget, in 1974, the population the countryside was half what it is today. Here are some um, temperatures for uh, areas around uh, Rutherglen, and they do show CO2 is going up, as always. The temperatures on the whole are showing a slight downward cooling trend, uh, which is opposite to what one would think. So, um, it doesn't appear that uh, things are getting worse in the, in the long term. And of course, the eucalyptus trees only survive where they are because they like to be through fire. The seeds don't germinate if they haven't been burned. And two months after the fire went through, the eucalyptus is back in work, back in business. Here's a, <clears throat> six rainfall the sets of rainfall records for the area from Sydney to Melbourne. Um, and that's the area that covers Sydney, down to Melbourne, this, this little triangle in here. The red line is 1900 in each case. Um, the blue line is um, 800 millimeters of rain in each case. And you can see there's quite a lot of variation, but there's no obvious trend to get it warmer, drier, wetter, cool, or anything. Um, so there do not seem to be a trend toward warmer, drier times at all on that data set there. Um, you've probably seen this before, but people have been um, predicting things are going to go worse, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse. Well, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and you may remember that the Tim Flannery thought that desalination nation plants would save us. Well, he was dead wrong. They haven't been used hardly. So. Uh, here's, here's a series of predictions that were first made in 1970 and they would continue. People keep making predictions that things are going to get worse and the CO2 content in the atmosphere keeps going up. So we've got a climate emergency. We were doomed in 1989 by 65 million, 65 parts per million of human CO2. And don't forget we had the acid rain issue in the 1980s, which seems to have gone away now. Why is all this what the confusion and difficulty happening? Well, here's one explanation. Uh, this is the latest series of uh, projections from the IPCC modeling has been done to anticipate what is going to happen in the next 25, 50, 100 years. The blue and the green are the satellite temperature data. The satellite temperature data is down here at about 0.4 of an increase over the zero. Uh, whereas all the projections, almost all the predictions are for much, something much warmer. And we're told that we don't, shouldn't get above 1.5 degrees centigrade because the models say everything will go haywire. But in fact, we're not anywhere near 1.5. And it does look, um, oh, hang on, sorry, I passed that too soon. Um, it does look 
is that the IPCC were right when they said that climate is a coupled, non-linear, chaotic system, and therefore the future, the long-term predictions of future climate states is not possible. This is what they said in their early, earliest uh, um, report, and yet they predict, or rather they project, and panic. Here's the previous slide, simply down uh, to just the um, average prediction of all those models and the temperature data down below. So if you project the temperature data forward, you get to 0.8 of a degree centigrade, and if you nowhere near the 1.5, is the IPC's worst case. So I've got to look now at if it's some, some data that's more uh, to do with real data rather than uh, thinking about what the IPCC is or is not doing. Um, global sea level rise, there's a lot of talk about that. People say it's accelerating, it's not accelerating. But here's a, um, a plot of temperature data where you can see quite definite increase from about 1850 Temperatures have been going up, not evenly, it's been going up fairly quickly there, slowing down fairly quickly, slowing down fairly quickly. Uh, but the average over the whole of that period is 1.8 millimeters a year. Uh, the red intervals, if, if they continue, would, would be three millimeters a year. This is Fort Denison in Sydney with some photographs from 1885, but to 2015 it looks pretty much the same. And on the left, uh, we've got the uh, sea level, highest tide and low tide, projected from 1923 to 2013. And there doesn't seem to be anything to panic there because it's uh, one millimeter per year. That should be per year. Sorry. We're also told that the Arctic ice is melting. This creates a panic because people get worried about it, which is understandable. I worry about it. But in fact, what you tend not to hear about is that the Antarctic is getting thicker. Uh, CO2 increases. And if you mentally tried to average the blue and the red curve, you'd come out with something that didn't seem to suggest that overall um, there was a problem. People worry about glaciers melting. Well, they do melt, they absolutely do melt. And here's a picture in 1856, the great Alec Glacier in uh, uh, Switzerland. Uh, and you see a little pile of rubble here on, on, on the right. And that little pile of rubble is there again on the right here. And you can definitely say that that glacier has melted. But the glacier at its height in 1857 was at the end of the Little Ice Age when that glacier photograph was taken. And since then, um, the, the, the length of the glaciers has shrunk. It's got lower, less and less and less, with occasional ups, ups. And at the moment, we have seen melting that's taking place in this region here and here, following that increase in thickness um, in the 1970s. When people look at glaciers, they tend to worry, um, quite understandably, when they're melting and retreating. But what they sh perhaps should also look at is when did the glacier first begin? And here we've got um, some interesting numbers. Um, this Hans Towson glacier in Greenland only began to grow 4,000 years ago. We had ice cores to the to basement uh, for this um, glacier. Mount Alaska, in Alaska, in Mount Churchill, it only began to grow 2,500 years ago. In Peru, the Kokaya uh, glacier, which is melting vigorously, only began, only came into existence 1500 years ago. And in Wyoming, we've got the Fremont glacier, which only began about 300 years ago. Somewhere between the Peru and the Wyoming date, Kilimanjaro developed its gla glaciers, which are now melting. But they did not begin to grow uh, until this time. And the, the blue curves are temperature data. And you can see that they're trending downwards very gently from 4,000 years ago to the present day. There's an overall gentle decrease, gross fall in temperature. And these glaciers are starting off of beginning their lives because it is, in the regional sense, getting colder and colder. People worry about cyclones. Well, here are the Australian cyclones. Their frequency does not seem to be um, increasing. Uh, this is from the Bureau of uh, uh, Bureau of Meteorology, and um, it's there. There's the data. It's available on their on their web server. Um, cyclones do not seem to be getting worse. 
This is the average number of very hot days in Australia. Um, again, from the Bureau of Meteorology from 1910 to 2016. Nothing much seems to be happening in terms of a trend of either increase or decrease in the number of hot days. But CO2 is definitely going up. The storms are a panic. I do like this photograph because it's, it's uh, quite splendid. Uh, but this was in 2013. And this is, they say that many people say that dust storms are getting worse, getting more frequent, getting more of a problem. However, if you look at the data, um, this is data, dust storms from 1957 to 2010. And clearly uh, up to 70 days of the year were classified as having dust storms in South Australia, Southeast Australia. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Then round about 1974, the number of dust storms for some reason stopped. And you get this small amount of activity here. This is on the right is Alice Springs, same thing. A lot of activity in the 60s, very little subsequently. Now let's spend a little bit of time on this one. Because it, it's central to what I want to talk about. And this is temperature data from 1900 to 2020, to 2020. And you can see it's, it's not uniform. It is increasing, there's no question about that. We're living in the warmest time in the last, since the Industrial Revolution, quite definitely. But there's something not quite right. 1910 to 40, 1943, see, temp, uh, temperature went up by half a degree with only 12 parts per million increase in CO2. Half a degree is half of the total temperature increase since the Industrial Revolution. And between 43 and 78, we have a 20 parts per million rise in CO2, but minus one degree centigrade uh, temperature fall. Right, from 78 to 98, 30 parts per million CO2 and a half a degree again, another half degree, that's a lot. And that's something to worry about. Then from 98 to 28, 43 parts per million CO2, and only 0.2 of a degree centigrade increase. So it doesn't seem that this story of increasing CO2 is linked directly to increasing uh, climate. Uh, but here's the nuclear winter. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And as I'm calling this the first IPCC panic, Quite understandably, when temperatures started to go up and CO2 was going up, they had everyone should have needed to pay attention. The second panic was because that trend had stopped. This is um, this is from 1995 to 2020, with an expanded scale, uh, to show basically after the El Nino of 1998, La Nina was cool. Temperatures trended pretty much from uh, left from left to right. So we got the 2016 El Nino when temperatures went up again and they are up, but they should be much, with 43 parts per million CO2, they should be significantly higher. The heat that has caused bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef this year apparently is, is due to the um, Indian Ocean dipole. Uh, it's a similar thing to El Nino, which happens in the Indian Ocean. Very strong signal this year created heat in Southeast Australia. Now, I've just look briefly at the, um, the nuclear winter, which I lived through in university in the 60s. We were told that, uh, that um, we were going to enter another ice age. That was the you know, thing that 97% of scientists believe in global cooling. People were designing ice breaking oil tankers. They were so convinced that it was going to be cold that we were going into an ice age. So 90%, 7% of scientists believed in global cooling. Now, 97% appear to believe in global warming. CO2, meanwhile, seems to ignore both the increase in temperature and the decrease in temperature. What happened to the cold, the nuclear winter? Well, this end, uh, chart, the black line is the chart I just showed you, the temperature increase and decrease, it ended about 1972. This was put out by NCAR in 1974. 
NASA who took over from NCR in 2017 using the same data, oops, sorry, using the same data, um, managed to produce a completely different result. And the climate gate, which I may come back to, or if you've got any questions, but this intention to do this was, was, was presented in the climate gate emails where they said that they were uh, going to have to get rid of uh, the blip, which they call this cooling, because it didn't fit in with the story of global warming, which it certainly does not. CO2, got a long history, 600 million years of history here, and I've marked on there three ice ages relevant to this uh, discussion. The Silurian um, Ice Age CO2 content on the atmosphere was somewhere in the order of 5,000 parts per million as opposed to the 410 nowadays. Ice Age at the end of the Carboniferous and the Permian, which affected Australia, CO2 was 300, uh, was 500 parts per million, a little bit higher than today. Then in the Jurassic, the Jurassic Ice Age, CO2 was up to, um, to 2,400 parts per million. So there doesn't seem to me there to be a strong correlation between CO2 levels in the atmosphere and temperature. So now I'm going to look in detail at the area from the uh, Cretaceous to the present day. And one of the things that's fascinating about that is the increase in marine and, and uh, uh, land-based plants and animals fantastic increase in diversity that began somewhere in the Cretaceous and if you look at that slope and think about the falling CO2 in the last 150 million years and you put that graph on upside down it's, sort of this, it's mirroring um, the decline in CO2 and cause, correlation doesn't mean causation I'm not suggesting that they there's any cause going on here, but the vast the progressive decrease in CO2 in the atmosphere and the progressive increase in biodiversity seem to be in, in, an interesting, interesting thing to think about. And in 32 million years ago, um, the CO2 levels were so low, became so low compared to what they'd been before. They had never been as low. As they were 30, as they are now and have been since 32 million years ago. 32 million years ago, uh, nature devolved, evolved C4 photosynthesis, which is a form of photosynthesis that works particularly well in low CO2 atmospheres. A couple more quick climate changes. Um, 2.8 million years ago, uh, there was a huge change. This is the temperatures. Benthonic, benthic um, foraminifera going down, gently going down. 2.8 million years ago, the slope of the of the cooling increases, and the frequency of uh, temperature change changes. And then, 1.2 million years ago, it changed again. Now, the red and the green arrows. This is climate change. That's serious climate change. Something frantically important happened. You'll be very familiar, I think, hopefully with this. And what we've got here is the um, temperature and CO2 content for the last 450,000 years. And first thing to note is that temperature changes in CO2 does not change. Temperature, in, particularly in, coo in a cooling regime, very significantly delay is delayed by, um, it follows, CO2 follows the temperature. Um, we are currently in an interglacial. I mean, there are four interglacials, warm periods. The Holocene that we are in now is the coldest interglacial there has ever been. And when you move when the maximum radiation down here, the CO2 was 180 parts per million up to the Holocene, very short period of time. You got a hundred parts per million rise in CO2 and eight degrees centigrade increase in temperature. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've had an increase of 125 parts per million CO2, but only one degree centigrade. And half of that one degree 
happened to natural causes before 1943, when there was no, almost no CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, human CO2. Slight deviation, this is the early headland. Uh, this is, I think this is a raised beach, which is about 10 meters above present sea level. That's an that's a, a Emian, possibly Emian beach. It's about 10 meters above sea level. And it sits here, there's Burley Heads. And the location there, if you walk around the headland, you can find that on the left side. It's, it's, it's the outcrops of the beach, raised beach, all the way around here. Uh, I, like, I love this picture because it's so colourful and uh, it's, it tells an awful lot of information. The yellow is the CO2, the scale on the left, 200, 300, 400 parts per million. The red is temperature. The grey is the ice volume calculated. Uh, blue insulation, the amount of, of the energy coming from the sun that gets here. And the black line is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. Purple is dust, and one of the things that's most characteristic about the depth of the glaciation is you get the, very, the planet becomes very desiccated, very dry, and you have dust blowing around all over the place. And uh, that's what we've got here. So, and also, if you look carefully, you can see CO2 doesn't change until um, temperature has gone quite a long way. The first of these black lines, you get a foot. Temperature is falling off. CO2 is not. CO2 is trundling along about 270, 280 parts per million until nearly 10,000 years after the temperature starts to fall here. 10,000 years after the temperature starts to fall, the CO2 begins to fall. If you look at the same information, here we've got the uh, ice core temperature data from the Antarctic in blue and from the Greenland in green. And in red at the bottom, taken from the previous chart as the CO2 content of the atmosphere. And that's when it gets down to 180 parts per million. These temperature changes are eight to 10 to 12 degrees centigrade temperature change taking place over 10, 20, 100 years in temperature, decreasing in temperature, increasing in temperature, decreasing in temperature, with not a flicker or a glimmer from the atmospheric CO2, which doesn't even particularly match uh, temperatures in the Antarctic either. Now I'll move on, we're going to look at the Holocene in a bit more detail. And here's a close-up of that zone, the boundary between the last uh, ice age, lowest point, coldest point of the, the previous ice age, Temperatures rose here in the Younger Dryas to the same temperatures as during the Little, little Ice Age in, the, in, the, uh, in the Europe. And once the temperature rose to the top, that's the Holocene, the maximum, then temperatures start to fall. CO2 was falling while sea level was rising, and then CO2 started to increase by 20 parts per million while the temperature is declining. This is the previous 20,000 to 10,000 years ago. Uh, for the glacial maximum here, you can see plotted uh, temperature and CO2. The temperature chain increase takes place here. Temperature starts to increase. CO2 doesn't really start to increase until there. So there's a lag. There's quite definitely a lag. Here, temperature starts to fall, <clears throat> but CO2 rises. Here, where you have a temperature increase, uh, which roughly round about the end of the Younger Dryas, which isn't particularly visible in Antarctica, as we saw from the previous slide, you've got a, an increase in temperature, which doesn't really appear in the CO2 until there. So again and again and again, which no matter what scale you look at it, it does see the temperature um, chases CO2, and that sometimes CO2 basically ignores what's happening with the temperature. This is a close-up of that interval from 10,000 years ago to the present day. And you've got temperature falling in an overall sense and CO2 increasing by 20 parts per million. This has been known for a long time as the, as the Holocene enigma because it didn't fit into the, uh, the, the 
IPCC AGW hypothesis, because increasing CO2 should mean increasing temperature, but apparently not always. Um, this has been around for a long time, but the temperatures from Greenland ice cores to periods of warmth and when the ancient Egyptian Empire, the Roman Empire, and the medieval warm period, the Vikings settled in Greenland. They built houses, they grew crops, they had cattle and sheep, and they did very well till it got cold again, and they vanished. So the global forcings must, sorry, at this point that this is to illustrate, in order for this human CO2 to cause the global warming that we now have, then all of these kind of influences that you see, these changes in temperature, um, have to stop if all of the warming after 1950 is due to human CO2. All right. Uh, one last one on this. This is 1,700 years of uh, Antarctic carbon dioxide and temperature from BC AD, zero years forward. Temperature is going up and down quite significantly, one and a half degrees centigrade, and CO2 is trundling along quite happily um, as if nothing was happening. Um, I seem to have lost something there. Don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. I seem to have been lost control of this slide. Uh, Peter, can you um, assist me in this? It doesn't seem to be anything happening. Uh, there's not much I can do from this end. Uh, is oh, your okay? Uh, yeah, you go. It looks like, oh, it's a back, a back in control again. All right, so CO2 is trundling along quite happily at 280 parts per million. Uh, Temperature is going up and down. There is, doesn't seem to be any relationship. CO2 certainly is not driving. Whatever's changing those temperatures is not being driven by CO2. And no escape, look at this. No matter where, how, what, what your focus is, um, you find the same thing. This is temperature and annual CO2. We have the 19... The, El Ninos, and the, temp the CO2 rises afterwards. Uh, if CO2 was driving temperature, they should be the other way around. So what about CO2, if, it's co if people are concerned and nervous about it, understandably, but there are some benefits to CO2. And this, this is a very famous little shot, which has been around for a while. This is CO2, a tree grown in ambient CO2 which I think when this was done would probably have been about three, 380. Here's the same species. ...150 parts per million CO2. And it's, the most commercial greenhouses are aware of this trick of CO2. And most commercial greenhouses run their CO2 concentration between 1400 and 1800 part per million because CO2 does wonderful things for plants. And we're told that CO2 acidizing the uh, oceans. Well, here's a healthy bed of turtle grass in PNG, uh, quite happily sitting there with CO2 bubbling out of the seabed. Um, you would think that if CO2 was causing acidizing to happen, then you wouldn't have an awful lot of turtle grass. The other, many other things that CO2 does, this one is a measure of leaf area index, the increased size of the leaves on plants. And from the scale you can see here, no change. The green up to lilac is increased by 14%. The area size of the leaves on plants have increased by 14%, all thanks to CO2 and global warming, because warm temperatures um, help as well. Just to remind you, drought is not a new normal. Drought has happened many times before, and fires have happened many times before. They're not getting any worse, and not caused by, I don't believe, by increased human CO2. Yeah, it's the IPCC, 
anthropogenic global warming hypothesis blames all the warming on human CO2 emissions, which is why they want us to cut our emissions. But the question is, if CO2 lags or ignores temperature, how does it cause climate change? And if CO2 You may notice that you know this lady on the left. And she said, You stole my childhood. I think it's somebody who would like to have their childhood stolen is over here. Uh, and Earth Day was two weeks ago. Everybody switched off everything for an hour. Well, every hour of the day as in North Korea is uh, Earth, Earth Hour. And if we, anyway, so how am, I, how am I doing for time? Thank you. So real pollution gets sidetracked by all of this concentration on CO2. That needs money spent on that problem right there. And finally, here are some uh, websites that if you're in interested in pursuing this that you might be, like to take a note of. Friends of Science, Inconvenient Facts is a lovely, he has an app which you can download for free onto an iPhone. And it's got some of the graphs life is to persuade the Australian government to exit the Paris Accord. And I'm not asking anybody to believe me or to do what, whatever, just let you know that this is there, there are people. It isn't true that 97% of scientists believe in global warming is caused by human beings. There are an awful lot of people out there who do not. So, uh, so I could talk more about this, but I think, Peter, you think that's far enough? Uh, we've got uh, maybe another five minutes. There's only a couple of questions uh, that have been put forward at the moment. Okay, All right. well, I'll just quickly rattle on this. In order to get net zero carbon, what we would have to do is go from this trajectory, of coal, oil and gas, that's the current production today, to this one. All of the, this will be in hydro, um, solar and wind only provide 4% of the energy we use on the planet today. They've got to replace all of the oil, all of the natural gas, all of the coal. And if you just took the small cars and buses and got rid of them and replaced them with electric vehicles, you still haven't touched the issue of what to do with planes and large trucks, synthetic and boats, ships, Synthetic fibers, mines and factories. Can all of that be replaced by solar, wind, and hydro and nuclear, which of course many people don't like? Why is this a problem? Well, here's Cooper PD, uh, it's got diesel hybrid um, power generation, and it's good, it's excellent. Uh, it produces four, four megawatts of wind, one megawatt of solar, and then it's got a one megawatt battery, which uh, can give it half a uh, megawatt per hour of power if the wind stops blowing and the sun doesn't shine. But of course that doesn't, that doesn't happen. The wind often stops blowing and then you have these white areas which have got to be filled in. How do you fill them in? You have to have either batteries or a backup diesel, coal fired, gas fired power station to switch on when you need to keep things going, like the fridge. Then there's the, the significance of how large a solar panel you're going to have put in. This is a big one in the United States. And what are you going to do when it grows from trees? You've got to, that's all going to be kept clean, all going to be swept, and it gives a bit of work, but it doesn't do anything for biodiversity. Nothing lives under these. Under these um, and don't forget, you turn them off. solar power on the, on the roof. If there's a fire uh, you can't, and it's a sunny day, you cannot switch a solar power station, a power panel off. It continues to generate electricity until the sun is turned off. Uh, so if you have a fire in the day and the fire burns the roof, it's possible that the fire, firemen will not put out that fire because they don't want to get electrocuted. And here's wind, wind turbine. That, that I'm sure will not take off uh, in the rest of the world. That's in America. But a wind turbine, now a modern one, takes 900 tons of steel, 2,500 tons of concrete, 45 tons of plastic, 
and it will last for about 20 years. And what comes down cannot be recycled because it's too large to go in a shredder. As a, an 84 meter blade one wind turbine blade. So in waste was 40, 50,000 tons a year. By 2034, it'll be 225,000 tons a year coming from wind farms like this one. Electric power, wonderful stuff. Here's a car filling up with electricity. It's plugged in, but when the electricity runs out, you turn the diesel engine on that sits behind it to generate the electricity. And EVs have got 7,200. You know, Off to the side of the road, you can't tow it. The South to batteries, just a, briefly on batteries. South Australia had this wonderful, biggest battery in the world. And it saved the day when Lo Yang tripped. I remember very well. It was, uh, everybody was very excited. And, they, and this chart came out and showed, oh wow, isn't that fantastic? Look what look what um, renewables are doing. But look at the scale on the left hand side. Lo Yang was producing 560 megawatts. And the wind, the wind farm produced 8.5 megawatts and it only lasted three minutes. And people tell you with great glee that a, um, the Wahonzain wind farm can provide power for 30,000 homes for 77 minutes. That's the bit they never tell you. They say it can provide power for 30,000 homes. How many ho homes are there in Australia? Several million? How many batteries are you going to have to have? A huge number. And what about batteries? It, for the Tesla, if you replaced all the vehicles on the small vehicles on the road today with 600 million electric vehicles, you'd need three trillion batteries. Where are you going to get that from? At the moment, there are 40,000 children in a Chinese-operated Democratic Republic of the Congo mine digging out cobalt for so cell phones and telephones. This is what's going to have to increase, and it's going to have to increase like this. Here's a, here's a copper mine in Montana. Uh, in idea of scale, the little blue uh, shape there, that's the Statue of Liberty to scale in that pit. And can, can this be repeated with battery driven earth movers? I, I strongly doubt it. Could the batteries drive one of these things? Whereas well, a gas well head, that's it. What you see is what you get, and it produces energy day and night. So I've done that. Howard, I think we might leave yep, it there. I We've got I, yeah, I've finished, quite a yep. few questions coming in now. So. Right, okay. okay. Right. Thank you, Howard. Um, I'll go through some of these questions. There's a couple that have a little bit of overlap, but uh, we'll see what we've got here. Um, one here from uh, uh, Alexandra Bonner. Do you have an idea or exp explanation for the sharp increase in temperatures in modern times? Uh, yeah, um, as I showed in that chart, one of the charts there from 1910 to, to, to the present day, temperatures have gone up, but they have also gone down. From 43, 1943 to um, 1978, temperatures went down, CO2 went up. From 1978 to 1998, temperatures did go up. They rattled up that in a period of 20 years, they definitely went up. And then they, they continued only to drift up very slowly from after the El Nino of 1998. They just went more or less sideways. Yet the CO2 was 43 parts per million. That's four times bigger than it was in the early part of the century. So see, the temperatures should actually be significantly warmer than they are. Where it would, uh, the, and so the, uh, the global activity, the, the natural warming that you see and cooling that you saw earlier on, that's continuing somewhere buried in amongst there uh, is um, the contribution of the planets, the solar system, uh, and everything that goes together that, that drives the climate, and has driven the climate for 600 million years. Uh, what hasn't driven it has been CO2. Uh, it's a, it's a, an equation we need to solve, because I don't think anybody knows uh, exactly how much warming CO2 produces. It does produce some warming, but there's huge dis difference of opinion from the IPCC, which claim that the human component only produces all of the warming. That's one position. 
to the other position, and that is that all of the variation you see is natural and is driven by natural forces, which can be de demonstrated. So it's, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I do know that, yes, we are living in the warmest time, the warmest part of the century. It's warmer than it's ever been since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Absolutely no question about that. But if CO2 is the driver, it should be another half a degree or more warmer than it is today. Okay, thanks for that. Um, question here from uh, Guido Staltari, who actually asked the question before we started, but uh, I think uh, it, it still fits in there. Um, what are the comparative roles of the other gases, especially water vapour? Do we understand them well enough? Could you just, sorry, I missed the first part. Uh, what are the comparative roles of the other gases, especially water vapour? Do we understand them well enough? Um, I don't understand them well enough to give a lecture on it right now, but water vapour is way ahead the most important um, uh, greenhouse gas. I mean, the, the difference could really simply be illustrated if you think of being in the middle of the Simpson Desert. And it's hot in the daytime and it's as cold as hell at night because there's no water vapour in there. It's not CO2. They have, the Simpson Desert's got 410 parts per million. Then go up to the um, to Townsville or Cairns, uh, you've still got 410 parts per million. You've got an awful lot of water vapor in there, and that keeps the temperature level. So you don't fluctuate. The nighttime temperatures and the daytime temperatures are pretty much the same. And the bulk of that, volumetrically, the bulk of that is caused by uh, water vapor. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, got uh, two <coughs> similar questions from uh, Doug Jones and uh, John Menzies. Um, I'll ask them both together, but they're pretty much the same. What is your view of BOM's modification of the historical temperature records in Australia? Uh, would you like to talk a little regards the manipulation of the instrumental data in the USA and Australia? Uh, yes, I would like to talk about it. I do have a couple of slides on that. Uh, it's a subject which is close to my heart. When I saw the um, the nuclear winter disappear when NASA kept bringing out more charts, or each of which showed that there was no nuclear winter. It all vanished. And climate gate people said, this is what we are going to do. We are going to change the data so that that goes away. And no one did anything. Uh, but Jennifer Morarahasi has done a lot of work on temperature data in, the, in Australia. And one, one, several examples, um, one of the hottest days of the year was dismissed as because it fell on a Sunday. And he said, the uh, BOM said it can't possibly be real because no one goes to work on a Sunday. Well, if you were looking after temperature and you knew it was, this was the hottest day you'd ever had, you would go into work and you would record the temperature. Anyway, so there's a lot of that that goes on. People, selection of the data, then there's manipulation of the data where they say, ah, oh, we need to have, um, uh, we need to balance what we're measuring, which we don't think is right. And we're going to bring in information from the surrounding um, stations. But when they did that with, to the, I think it was the Mulcahy area, um, they brought in temperature data from Hamilton Island to create the model that they used to explain why the actual temperature was warmer than it was. Another thing she discovered was that um, when they put the new thermometers in in Perisher, and put brand new digital thermometers, wonderful things, absolutely top of the tree, best stuff you could possibly have but they don't go lower than minus 10. So if they don't go lower than minus 10, how can they record minus 12 that the people who lived there were recording? They can't. So there's been a lot of, I, I don't know what I've got, I'm not gonna make a, a pass an opinion on why it was done, how, but how it was done is manipulation. It's rife throughout the industry and it, it needs to be resolved because it's, you can't have a sensible discussion when you can't believe the numbers you're using to produce a graph. And I feel this just as bad because I'm relying on mostly on um, raw data. And then raw data has its problems as well. Everything has problems. Uh, but nothing is as bad as the, what appears to be, uh, if you look at the um, track record of the temperature data in Australia, as charts were produced over time, you see that the, anything before about 1940, the temperatures get, um, warmer, don't get colder, sorry. And anything after that time, the temperatures that are adjusted temperatures are warmer. So they're doing the same adjustment to one set of data and one lot is getting hotter and the other lot's getting colder. 
But what that does is increase the slope that shows that global warming is something to be frightened of. Now, I'm not saying that they've done this deliberately, with malfeasance, anything like that. But that is what has happened. That has changed the data, and that changes the slope. So we need desperately to get into the data and find out what we can trust and what we can't trust. Um, and I totally, we need to resolve it. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, a couple more questions. We're running out of time, but we'll see if we can get through a couple more. Uh, one from Doug Young. Uh, Howard, so you agree that there is some global warming happening, particularly in the last 100 years. However, it is clearly not due to CO2 increases. So what is causing the increase? Uh, the increase is being caused by um, the, the cycle that began in 1857, when you've had a, uh, a, the Little Ice Age, when people starved to death in Europe and crops failed and people died. Half the population of some countries in Europe died during the Little Ice Age. Uh, that was a natural event, the cooling, the glaciers grew. Then it, nature turned a corner and temperatures started to rise. In 1856, as we saw from that graph of the, of the glaciers, um, started to rise and it's been rising ever since. So it's, not, it's coming out of a cold period and that's what all of the graphs I showed you have this constant sawtooth effect. Tremendous increase in temperature, very sharp, sharp increase over a very short period of time, followed by a slow progress down into a cold period, then back it goes again. The driver for that appears to be mainly the Milankovitch cycles. Um, this, the, the spin of the Earth on its axis, the ellipticalness of the Earth circuit around the, around the Sun, and so on. One a good example of the, of the effect that the, the atmosphere has, and the, and the seas have, is that on January the 5th this year, this, the Earth was the closest in its current orbit, the closest it ever came to the Sun. But on January the 5th this year, the average temperature of the Earth was at its coldest. If you were on the Moon, which sits beside us, it was at its warmest because it was closest to the Sun and it was responding purely to solar insulation, solar ir irradiation. So the Moon was at its hottest on January the 5th, the Earth was at its coldest because the climate is driven not just by the sun, but by the cycle, by cycles of, uh, by the um, Milankovitch cycles, but also by uh, the interaction between the fact that the Arctic is a sea surrounded by land, and the Antarctic is land surrounded by sea. And they, they behave quite differently as they pass through the different phases of the year. Uh, they have completely different patterns, but you can see echoes of the, the northern hemisphere shows the most extreme variations. The southern hemisphere shows much less. But the average temperature of the southern hemisphere is always higher than the average temperature in the northern hemisphere. So that comes into the equation. There are dozens of things that come into this thing. But the, the primary driver are um, the things that drove the last ice ages, where every roughly 100,000 years, it goes from being cold to being warm. Then it cools off again. Now, Whatever's driving that is what's driving the current temperature increase. Okay, thanks, Al. We've got two last questions which we'll sneak in, and we've just got a little bit over time, but we'll get them in. A uh, question from uh, Keith Whitehouse. Uh, you mentioned nuclear winter. What nuclear winter? There has not been one. It's a theory only. Could you just, what hasn't there been a theory of? Uh, Keith uh, asks, uh, well, more states and us. Uh, you mentioned nuclear winter. What nuclear winter? There has oh, yeah. not been one. It's a theory only. Oh, oh right. No, no, no. No, it's not a theory. It became it, the, the name is a misnomer. It became called the, the nuclear winter because um, some some people did an experiment and ran a program, and they imagined what would happen if we go into a nuclear war. And what would have lots of soot. The world would get colder. Would get progressively colder. So as the, as the world was getting colder, they said, well, what could be causing this? And they said, well, we started letting off atom bombs in 1943. And we left, let off atom bombs and nuclear bombs until about 19, whatever it was, 60 something or other. That theoretically would have, could, should have caused the cooling. And the, temp the first chart I showed you, which showed that the temperature fell from 1943 back almost to the same level as it was in 19. Uh, 06, and the temperature started to rise. So you had this rise and fall. That fall is known colloquially as the nuclear winter. But 
they, it was massaged out of existence. The numbers were fiddled over a period of about 10 years and it disappeared as an, as an uh, 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 vanished from the record. Um, but it did happen, but it wasn't a nuclear winter. It was it got given that name uh, because I think uh, Francois Sargon uh, wrote a book about it too, and it was became a very popular thing to do at the same time as CND marches. Were, 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 it was an extremely popular phrase to use about the nuclear winter. But that's I can remember it because I was at university then, and I was told by my learned professor uh, that we without any doubt at all we are going to go into a new ice age because everything is getting colder. In 1978, the temperature started to rise, and that was the beginning. And it only rose for 20 years. Climate is supposed to be 30 years activity. Well, 1978 to 98 is only 20 years. I hope that okay. sort of half answered the question. Uh, yes, yeah, says uh, thanks for the explanation. Was not aware of that, so he's uh, happy with that. Um, the very last question I'll leave uh, was on uh, from Russell Mears. Uh, and the question is, what is driving sea level rise? Sea level rise is driven by lots of things. Um, and it's, it's an extraordinarily complicated issue because a, a paper has just been published, with, which they've had long last. They have a, about, oh, eight years or so ago, they started dropping buoys all over the world, all the oceans. And they're now getting temperature, good temperature data from the surface down to about 1,500 meters of the sea, seabed. And what they have found is that the, one of the contributions, contributors to sea level rise is if the earth warms, then the ocean will expand. And that's, there's no question about that. If that's all that happens is the earth got warmer, then the oceans would expand, the sea level would increase. But in the Antarctic, sea level decreases at that, by, with that when that happens. So that's a little quirk that's just, just come in. But what's driving it is it's the end of the ice age and the rift ice age, glaciers are melting, as I showed you, glaciers are melting, the ice is melting in the, in the Arctic, uh, more rainfall is falling, because one of the equations that people bring out is they say, oh yes, so much ice has melted off the Antarctic, and that's equivalent to an inch of sea, sea level rise. But they forget, or don't seem to want to talk about, that if you melt all the ice around in Antarctic, at the Arctic, then you have more evaporation. The sea is warmer, and you get more precipitation. So not all of the ice that melts from Greenland becomes sea level rise. So, and it's a hugely complex area that I'm, I'm frankly terrified of. Um, but the general, to answer the question, it says, since 1857, glaciers melting all over the world have slowly increased the um, sea, sea level. And to give you a scale bar, when the sea, at the end of the last ice age, sea level rose by 11 to 15 millimeters a year. It's now rising by one to two millimeters a year. So it has gone up much faster in the past. What it's doing now doesn't seem to be extreme. But of course, if it went on for another 300 years, yes, places like New York would begin to have a problem. Well, thank you very much, uh, Howard. Uh, we have reached the end of all the questions. Uh, we're a bit over our time as well. Uh, thanks to all those who attended and um, stuck around to the very end. I think most people did hang around, which is great to see. Um, we will look forward to another talk next month. To look out in your um, AIG emails for mm -hmm. the details on the next one, and that one will be Holly Bridgewater. In the meantime, thanks very much, and good night to everyone. Well, what can I make? just say one last thing? If anybody wants to submit, send me a question through you, feel free to, later on if they want to. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, bye, bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for putting up with me. <laughs> Good evening all.